button there if you would. All right, so today I am here with Dakota Lynch and Emma Bortons, and I'm so excited because we're going to be talking about the Bible, scripture, and the importance of just bringing it into our homes, practically bringing it into our homeschooling life with our children and with just our families. So I want to first give Dakota and Emma some time to introduce themselves, talk about who they are, where they are in life, and just share anything they'd like to share. So ladies first, Emma, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Emma Bortons. I am um, a project manager at Classical Conversations, which is a um, homeschooling organization. And I'm also a nonprofit consultant um, for a foundation in New York City, which produces audio drama Bibles and helps to share and grow the public reading of scripture. And I'm Dakota Lynch. Uh, I live in Dallas, Texas uh, with my wife, Laura. We were actually both homeschooled K through 12, so have a lot of uh, connections with the homeschool community. And um, part of my story is that um, scripture memory has played a really significant role. And I started memorizing when I was a kid, but um, now I'm actually privileged to be on staff as the executive director of Scripture Memory Fellowship, which is a ministry that's been around since 1977, helping people memorize scripture. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you for sharing that. And there's so much more. Like whenever people ask for bios or intros, I'm like, I know it's a disservice. I know there's no way that you can tell your entire life or who you are or what makes you so amazing, how God uniquely created us. I know you can't do it in 30 seconds or even three hours, but that was a great nutshell, both of you. So I met two of you separately. Emma and I are both part of Classical Conversation. She shared how she's connected to Classical Conversation. I'm a mom who uses Classical Conversation, so that's my area. And Classical Conversations and Public Reading of Scripture had a collaboration where they invited us out to listen to the Bible. And it was such a beautiful experience to see not just local people from New York City, but people from all over the world gathered in an office and on Zoom to listen to Scripture in such a fast-paced system. Um, system and city where there's a rat race happening outside and there's like honking and all that. New York City has an office where people slow down and listen to the word of God. And Dakota, I met you at CHAPS convention in May of this year. And I was just really thrilled and intrigued to hear you just like quote scripture off the top of your head. And I'm like, I understand that there's technology. I understand that we have things at the tip of our fingers and we don't need to memorize things per se, but talking to someone from Classical Conversations where the bulk of the work is memorization and talking to you, Dakota, from scripture memory, I just wanted to talk a lot about the importance of memorizing scripture, the importance of scripture in general, and just bring it into our homes. But first and foremost, do you have a favorite scripture or Bible story or character that resonates with you either in your life in general, like your entire life's theme or something that you're going through right now? Dakota, I'll start with you. Yeah, I have two verses that have been so meaningful to me over the years. One of those is Romans 8.1. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And just what a beautiful reminder that is uh, in the midst of a, of a world where, you know, we're constantly um, facing facing opposition to our faith and, and facing different discouragement in life. But to just know at the end of the day, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But then another more unique verse uh, is all the way back in Deuteronomy 23, verse 5, and it says, that, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. And I just love that verse because it resonates with me. I've, I've been through some challenging times. My parents were divorced when I was 14, and what in some ways resembled a curse, mm. <laughs> a challenge. I feel like in many ways, God used that for good. He turned the curse into a blessing. So I love that passage. Yeah, I do too. Um, I'm just, uh, during this time, I, I know when we're recording, this is the nativity season. So I've been um, just thinking a lot about um, Mary and her story and and her parents and and how um, how much they they prayed to God for for her and then her whole um, you know dedication to the temple and then um, being um, drawn to Joseph and his listening and obedience to God um, is just such a important story to me and my family and especially during this time one that you know we read over and over and so um, that's what's been resonating with me in my life and. Um, 
And another one I like, I like to highlight um, women in the Bible when I can, but um, it's just, I've recently finished listening to um, the story of Esther um, in our public reading of scripture session and just being able to, um, to listen to a woman who um, not only was, was brave and, and risked her life to, um, to save her people, she was also very gracious and um, very respectful and humble and I think that that's something that's very countercultural right now is we think that in order to be effective, we don't need to be humble or gracious or um, or respectful. And, and so I appreciate those examples that um, the Bible has for, for women to be able to follow. And so, um, yeah, those are the two, the two stories that I've been meditating on most recently. And I love the practicality of how you look at the scripture and then you apply it to your own life and it resonates so deeply um, with you in, in whatever you're going through. And Dakota, I love how you take these scriptures and then really use it as an anchor. It's not just the words on a page. It's not just the book. It's not just an ancient history text. It is how can I apply what's going on in my life today, knowing that the word of God doesn't change. So I just think that's so beautiful. Um, for me, I would say it's Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, you know, the plans to prosper you and it's not to harm you. It's not for evil. It's not, it's always for good. And I look at it in every aspect of my life, whether something is happening that I don't understand and it doesn't look like it's going well, or even in everyday interaction. Like, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in happenstance. I don't think it was a coincidence that I met Dakota at CHAP, just listen to him. I think it was I won't say ordained from the foundations of the earth, but I will say that I think it was intentional that we met so that we could have this conversation and help others who need to realize the importance of being in scripture into their everyday lives. And I don't think it was a coincidence that you and I sat at a table together and we had dinner with Lee and we were able to have conversation. And then fast forward, I get an email saying, hey, let's meet for a public reading of scripture. And then you and I got to have more conversations that reaffirmed what I was doing and reassured me that as a parent, the decisions that I'm making are beneficial. Because again, when I see you, I'm like, this is the product of a homeschool and I want that. Emma's amazing, right? So if you two could just share more about your professional side, you, you started as a homeschooler and you decided to stay in a Christian organization. Was that just something that happened? I don't think so. Um, how much of it was intentional? Like, what was that process like? going from homeschooling, going to college and figuring out what to do, Emma? And like, how did you land at both classical conversations and public reading of scripture? Yeah. So um, I, after my, I guess, high school experience in classical conversations, I wanted to continue not only studying classically, but I wanted Christ to be at the center of my education or um, at least be a part of a curriculum that was from a um, Christian worldview. And so I stayed in a, a Christian college. It wasn't um, affiliated with any one particular denomination, but um, there were, it was obviously a very respectful community of, of Christians and, and Christian professors. And so that was important to me. And then um, upon graduating, I never felt um, pressure to be a part of a Christian organization. I never um, specifically narrowed my searches to Christian organizations. I've worked um, when I was in college and I've worked when I was in high school in um, secular organizations. And so that was never really something that I felt like I had to do. I knew that I could be a, a light anywhere and I knew that I would find community anywhere, but um, just certain um, opportunities presented themselves. I had a mentor who connected me with um, the foundation that I'm I'm currently serving um, in a part time capacity, and it was just from there where I, you know, naturally had um, a position, and so I kind of just had doors open to me that were fortunately in in Christian environments, and so. I, I took them, but it was totally a God thing. Like I, you know, I didn't narrow myself to something um, specific. I always just said, you know, God, what is your plan for me? Um, you know, I know I can do anything that I put my mind to, but what is it that you want me to do? And so 
that's how I found myself at, um, at the Grace and Mercy Foundation and then later at Classical Conversations. So, yeah. Am I, I right? It. You said, uh, you said it was a God thing uh, yes. I think about Jonah when he finally landed in Nineveh. If someone said, well, Jonah, tell us, how did you decide to come to Nineveh? He'd say, God just put me here. It <laughs> will being, being forced upon me almost. Uh, I feel like that's not a perfect illustration of my life, but it, it has some overlap because honestly, right out of high school, I was working in a, in a secular job. It was a good job. And I had this opportunity to change jobs and to go into another secular company. And I thought, this is this is my big shot. This is my chance. And as soon as I stepped into that role, I realized this is not a good fit at all. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I had a relationship with Scripture Memory Fellowship. And so I, I reached out. I said, hey, this job is not going to be good for me long term. So do you guys need my help in a more significant way? And God just kind of built my role with them into a full-time position over the course of the next six months or so. And during that time, I began to see just how um, much I wanted to be part of this ministry because scripture memorization had already been this hugely transformative part of my testimony. Mm -hmm. So I love memorizing scripture, and yet it was through my professional career kind of falling to pieces that I had the opportunity to step into this ministry in a, in a more meaningful way. And so, yeah, that's how I landed uh, at Scripture Memory Fellowship. It's interesting that you brought up Jonah because I just finished a Bible study probably a week ago on Jonah. And what really stood out for me is that a lot of times we see situations as these disruptors versus divine interventions, right? Like if you think about Jonah's story, he was like, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm, you know, these people, they're pagans. They don't believe in you. I'm not going there. And there was kind of some kind of self-righteousness, if you will. So it's like, here I am worshiping you. I'm holy. Why would I go and try to save people who don't quote unquote deserve it? And as I started to look through his story, I really started to it really brought me back again to Jeremiah 29, 11. Like every single thing that we go through, whether it's in the belly of a great fish or it's in, um, you know, you not feeling that it's a fit Dakota at the job that you're doing or Emma, if you being at Sephora or another company, everything that he puts in our path, there is a purpose for it. And it's really a great plan. And Emma, I love what you said in terms of being a light in darkness because a lot of the conversations I have with people It's like everyone thinks that they need to work in the church. And I'm like, no, we need leaders in the loss in the legal system. We need Christians in the entertainment industry because we're the ones who are going to make the change. If we're all under the church building, how are we being light and darkness? It's like preaching to the choir, right? So I think it's beautiful to see both sides, to see that you work in a secular industry and then people see the light. You're the tangible representation of Christ. It's not that you're beating them over their heads with the Bible, but they're seeing you and they're seeing that something's different and that opens the door for conversation. So I love that piece. And um, another thing I was going to say is when you talk about like some car- some um, or uh, professions, it seems like this well-orchestrated path. Like you'll have someone say, you know, when I was young, I would pull apart the remote and I would just be so curious and now I'm an engineer. And it just seemed like from three years old to 33 years old, they just knew what they wanted. And for me, it was never that well-orchestrated path in my head. God saw the big picture. He saw the big plan. He knew that the consultant job over here was going to bring me to the teaching job over there, which was going to um, prepare me for the coaching job over there. He saw it being all weaved together. But I was curious to see for both of you, it was this well-orchestrated path of, I was born a Christian and I was raised a Christian, then I went to Christian school and now I work in the Christian industry. So it's always amazing to hear your story. I'm just curious, I'm just nosy. <laughs> if it was an orchestrated path or, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I believe that God's hand is at work always and all times. And so in that case, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't I feel know, like it, that. You know, you have um you know, you have like so many moments in at least in my life and through my different like careers where it didn't seem well orchestrated, seemed it seemed kind of bumpy, but obviously looking back in retrospect, it always seems like, oh yeah, that was perfect. Like if I didn't go to that school and meet that person and and you know, take that internship or you know, go to that 
you know, planned networking event or do that, yeah. then you know, this wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, in retrospect, yeah, I guess everything seems so like it flowed into place, but, um, but, you know, it certainly doesn't feel like that at the time, some, some points in, in life. So yeah, I hope that <laughs> answered that question. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Looking back, you, you would never ask for chaos and yet it was <laughs> right. chaos that you said God's master plan all the more clearly because, you know, I, I said my job wasn't a good fit. Well, that was really an understatement. I was, I was just so sure that this is not for me. And I had what I think must have been some sort of nervous breakdown because I was mm -hmm. so overwhelmed by realizing that and having no plan B. You know, you you just left a job where everything was nice and secure. And now you've you've put it all on this one job and you know, I can't stay here. Mm -hmm. And for me as a young man, that that terrified me because, well, now what do I do? How do I provide for my needs? And then I, I had that opportunity to start with SMF and to begin ministry there. But honestly, I can look back and say, I would have never, I would never have left my secure corporate job mm -hmm. or a short-term position at a nonprofit ministry. Because when I started at SMF, that's all it was. It was a short-term temporary thing that couldn't yeah. promise I would be able to stay around in a permanent capacity. But I can see that God used that job that wasn't a good fit as a bridge because I never mm. would have stepped out of a corporate job with all of that security into the uncertainty of a nonprofit ministry. And yet, in hindsight, that was that was God at work. Yeah. So that just gives me a lot of confidence as I look to my future. Mm. Because sometimes there, there's chaos even in my life today, not quite as severe, but there right. are things I don't understand. What God, why are you doing this? But I can say, you know what? When it was 10 times worse, he had a plan. And so that gives me a lot of faith just to trust him in the uncertainty that I might face today in different areas of life. That's Thank true. you so much for sharing that and for being so transparent, because, you know, a lot of times we sell the gospel incorrectly. It's like, hey, get saved, become a Christian, and you'll never have a problem again in your life. And I'm like, that is so far from the truth. Like the Bible literally says that in this world, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have persecution, you're going to have all these things. But it's about the anchor. It's about the relationship. It's knowing even in the midst of those things, you have God. Even in the midst of these things, we can look to Jesus' story and remember that he went through all these temptations, all of this distress. And these are all understatements for what he went through, right? But he went through so much. And, you know, obviously, we know the end of how that worked out. So I want to get personal. And then I want to bring us back to um, memorization and bringing homeschool into the house. So... Dakota, you mentioned that your wife is also a homeschooler. Again, is that intentional or was it that, you know, that's how God ordained it and you didn't really see how that came together? That's another beautiful piece of the story. So when I uh, started this job at Scripture Memory Fellowship, they said, well, Dakota, we're in Texas. You live in Missouri. That's mm -hmm. fine. But why don't you start by coming down to Texas for one week? You'll work with everyone, kind of get a flavor for how things go. Well, I met this coworker named Laura, and I thought, she, she's awesome. I, I like this girl, and eventually she became my wife. So not only did God have uh, a job for me, but he had a wife uh, as wow. well. So yeah, wow. she was just like me in the sense that she grew up uh, in a homeschool family, you know, K through 12. And um, yeah, so our stories are pretty similar in that regard, and yet uh, it was just a, a divine appointment that he would bring us together at Scripture Memory Fellowship in that way. That is so beautiful. And your obedience and your discernment to just follow that path that God laid out for you is what allowed you to find your prize, to find your good things, to find your ruby and your treasure called your wife. Dakota, I also married a homeschooler, so we have that in common. <laughs> Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, I, I met my... Um, Actually, my mom met my husband at a homeschooling event because um, he was working. Um, he was working for Classical Conversations at the time, and so my mom kind of set me up on a date with my now husband. So um, yeah, so that's wonderful. Family is very important. Clearly, <laughs> not only are they um, in charge of you know your your education when you're. Um, homeschooled, but they can be great matchmakers. So. Yeah, an arranged marriage. I love it. 
<laughs> I guess, kind yeah, kind of. It was, <laughs> you know, it was a, a struggle um, in the beginning. I I like to say I did live in Nineveh because I was in New York City during the time, <laughs> and so we did um, long distance for um, almost two years, and so that was mm-hmm. challenging. But but God had a plan, so. I love it. I love the recurring theme of God having a plan. All right. So let's get to why is it important to memorize scripture? Like we, I'll just leave it there. Why is it important to memorize scripture? And like, what does that look like practically? Emma, do you want to jump in first? Yeah. I mean, well, I, I know that, you know, this is, you know, your, your bread and butter (laughs) at, at your foundation, but, um, for, for me, memorizing scripture has, um, more to do with, a classical education that I'm involved with at, at CC and just how that's the basis of, um, the grammar part of the trivium and, and knowing, um, knowing the word and, um, being able to, um, you know, pronounce it and then be able to compare it with others and later rhetoric have that, um, that presentation of it, that memorization. And so I would say that, that falls um, very much in line with uh, classical education and something that was important when I was homeschooled was being able to um, memorize scripture. And so, um, yeah, so that's what I would have to say about it, but I'll let you expand Dakota on um, the practice of memorizing. Yeah. So why why does scripture memory matter? I'm thinking of a verse, two verses in Psalm 119 uh, verses 92 and 93. It says, Unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts. Mm-hmm. By them you have given me life. I love those two verses, especially when you put them together, because the psalmist starts by saying, God, your word saved my life. And then in verse 93, so I will never forget it. Mm-hmm. God, your word saved me, and I'm going to cling to this. He sounds like someone who was driving on the highway and he had a traumatic car accident, but the only reason he survived is that he had his seatbelt on. And he says, so I am never going anywhere without buckling up. That's what I'm getting from this song. And that resonates with me because when I was 14, my parents were divorced. We moved away. My mom, my sister and I, we moved into my grandma's basement and all of my friends are, you know, 150 miles away. And I'm trying to cope with that as a teenager And I just started memorizing scripture. I read a book at the time that said, you ought to be memorizing scripture. So I took the challenge and, you know, I didn't enjoy it at first and I didn't really see the value until I was maybe three or four months in. And then I realized these verses are comforting me when I'm discouraged. They're giving me words to say when I don't know what else to say. I'm able to pray these verses back to God. So I I really had a a David experience, right, where I was saying, yeah, God, unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished during this time. And so I will never forget your precepts. Um, But another reason I would share is just that as homeschoolers, we really ought to care about memorizing scripture because for so many, they're homeschooling because they want their children to have a biblical worldview. And yet, I, I just can't say how often I've been to homeschool conferences, conventions, et cetera. And I meet homeschool students who don't know John 3, 16, who don't know the Lord's prayer, who don't know the fruit of the spirit. And I would just go out on a limb and say, they cannot possibly have a biblical worldview. They might know how Christians behave generally, but they don't have a biblical worldview, which is so often why they they graduate, they go out into the world and they fall away. We've seen the statistics you know, two thirds of Christian young people graduate and they don't go to church anymore. Well, why is it? Why do, why do they fall away from the faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, as it says in Romans ten seventeen. So I would say to all of the homeschoolers listening, memorizing scripture really should be a centerpiece for homeschool. If you're homeschooling because you want your children to have a biblical worldview, because that's the best way to ensure that they get one by hiding God's word in their hearts. You know, Dakota, what you shared kind of um, cues into what Emma and I were talking about this morning. We were talking about how sometimes when we're studying or we're trying to learn, it's so siloed. So it's like, okay, now it's time for history. Now it's time for science. Now it's time for math. Not realizing that if you really want to have a Christ-centered view, he is at the center of everything. And I think that's what's happening in probably a lot of homeschool families unintentionally. It's like, 
Okay, we're starting school. Now it's time for Bible. Open your Bible. Let's read. Okay, we're done with that. Now let's do the real work. And I think, you know, if we don't understand the importance of weaving it in or even understanding how to practically bring it all together, I think that's what's happening why after a while people are leaving it because they're seeing it as a separate thing, right? So instead of seeing, like the example I gave earlier was instead of seeing God in science based on the creation and things that he made and how, you know, these things form together and all the amazing things that God does and seeing geography with the mountains and the waters and all those things and seeing him in history. Instead of seeing him in everything, we see it as, well, this is one thread and that's another thread and there's no way that they correlate. Emma, did you want to kind of like elaborate on what we chatted about somewhere? Yeah, no, I think um, that Dakota is touching on a real problem um, that, you know, we see in the homeschooling community and even just generic Christian um, community about that falling away. And, you know, if you don't hide God's word on your heart, um, you know, how are you, you know, how, how will you stand? And, and so that's kind of what we do with um, the public reading of scripture is um, we go back to like the very first, you know, part of, um, of that memorization. And it's, and it's like, you know, what, how do you start with, um, with, with, feasting on scripture. And that comes from the very early stages of infancy. And like, I have, um, God children and my godson will come up to me and just say like book, and he'll just give me a book and I'll just sit with him and I'll just read to him. And he doesn't know the words he doesn't, he maybe can identify like apple on a page or, but, you know, Adam and Eve, I, he hear, hears what I'm saying, but he can't read it yet. And so that's that first component of listening. Um, you know, Revelation 1, 3, you know, blessed is he who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things. And so that's the first stage is the practice of listening to scripture is children being able to hear it from, um, hear it from their their parents and be able to practice that skill of hearing the word of God um, before before reading it themselves and before memorizing. And so um that's something that I've noticed as you as you get older and in that early development stages, it's so much easier to have a kid, you know, listen and then read, learn to read and then memorize because their their brains are just like sponges. And it's such a you know, formidable time. And I know for me, like I knew so much more scripture, like memorized it than I do now. And I'm totally okay with saying that is because I was at a time where, you know, my brain wasn't as inundated with things as it is now. And as I got older, and especially during my time in New York City, where sitting with the Bible and, and reading it and memorizing it was practically a lot more difficult than when I was younger and I had someone, you know, pulling me through it. And so that's how I got back involved with the public reading of scripture and being able to listen to extended passages of the Bible, not just verses. So like sitting and listening for an hour of scripture, doing it in community, you know, first Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching it, and then regularly doing it every single week. Um, you know, delight in his law and meditate on it day and night, ideally do it every day. Um, but for me, I, I like to join the community aspect, um, every week and then listening, like I said, to the whole Bible or extended passages. And so, and so that's where I think that, um, yet yeah, where we can get back into scripture memorization is by taking the time to actually listen to God's word. Um, and then we can go back through, those stages of learning and it's hard. It's really hard to do, but that's what I think is important about community, having people to, you know, to encourage you to memorize more and to help you be there for you to read it out loud to you or to, it seems so, um, it seems like something we shouldn't have to do as adults, but sometimes we have to go back to those beginning stages of learning and, um, and go from there. And so, I think just as we age, we generally fall away just due to life and um, the bumpiness, I guess, of the of the course. And um, and so that's why it's important to start young, you know, do that in the beginning and then 
you know, if you fall away, come back to it, you know, find community, listen to scripture first. You know, if it's hard to read, just have it read to you. Um, the art of listening has been lost in my generation and the attention span has dwindled. So all those things are really important, I think, for us to get back on track with memorizing scripture and um, and actually keeping to it as Christians. Dakota, I have so much to say based on what she said, but I want to let you jump in and then I'll share my thoughts. Uh, one, one passage that came to my mind is uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. They'll be as frontlets between your eyes, and bind them upon the posts of your uh, of your door, write them upon the post of your door. I think that passage describes parents who are leading by way of example, mm -hmm. which which should be convicting, I think, for for parents, because so often what I've seen is that, you know, that the child might be memorizing as part of their homeschool or maybe as part of their their church children's program, right? And and yet parents sometimes think that they get a pass. And and so I think that yes, yeah, scripture memory should be heart, part of homeschool, but it should go even deeper than that. It should just be part of following God as a family, because uh, I, I think that following God and, and cherishing his words really should and, and, and ought to go hand in hand. So yeah, I was just um, reminded of the importance that, that we as adults take this just as seriously as we're insisting that our kids do as part of their homeschool and lead by way of example. Yeah, that's it. You have to model the behavior too. And one of the things that I kept hearing as both of you were talking was the importance of forming habits, right? So like if if someone will say that it takes 21 days to form a habit, right? So if we are doing something with kids as young as babies or infants or toddlers growing up and they're listening to scripture or they're seeing us read and listen to the scripture, that's where the Bible talks about training for child in the way that they should go. So the falling away that you talked about, Dakota, was the fact that these habits were not formed. These were things that people either did out of obligation or they did because, you know, mommy says you have to do it, daddy says you have to go to church versus it actually being something that was transferred onto them that they actually wanted to do that became a part of their lives, right? Because when you form a habit, it's not something that you're thinking about. You just wake up in the morning, okay, I have to brush my teeth. You wake up in the morning, you say you have to do this. So imagine us modeling this behavior, like you said, listening to scripture together as a family, and it not just being a thing to check off the to-do list, right? But a real part of your lifestyle and a real part of life that anchors you. I think it's something that will really help in the later years when, you know, things do become busier or, you know, you're making your own decisions as teenagers or adults. But if it is a part of something that you form as a habit, it's so much easier to continue. And once you get up that habit piece, you actually start to enjoy it and desire it and even um, yearn for it because it's something you start to enjoy now versus doing out of obligation. So I think that's a really important piece that you guys brought up. Yeah. And I would just say, I think that so many of the young people who grow up and, and they disconnect from the faith and, and, and they're not going to church anymore, they're not following God. I don't think it's because they just failed to, you know, maintain the habit of of doing these things, but they really, they didn't see any reason to continue, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, we've all grown up and moved away from home, and there are probably some things that we're doing that our parents didn't do. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we shop at stores that they didn't like, or we, you know, no big deal. And I think what happens for so many young people is they launch into adulthood and suddenly their worldview is challenged by a college professor, by a mm -hmm. friend, by someone that they just encounter. And, and that person might say, well, why do you believe that we should live in this particular way? And so often the only thing that child can remember is the, what mom and dad said, right. what their pastor said, what their grandma taught, but there's nothing more authoritative for them to land on. They can say, thus my mom said, but they can't say, thus the Lord says. Mm -hmm. I think that if we give them that, right, if we say, this is why we believe this as Christians, we we do these things and we don't do these things, and here is why, this is what the scripture teaches, 
they can grow up and question everything that we ever thought. But as long as they have the Bible underneath that, I think that'll that'll give them something more of an anchor to hang on to. I, I remember one man's testimony. He said, I wandered away from the faith, but all of the verses that I memorized were like explosives that my parents detonated by prayer when they started lifting me up to the Lord. And all of those verses began to just wreak havoc on his conscience, right? Uh, and I think that's what can happen when you plant God's word in the hearts of your children. It doesn't guarantee that they'll walk with the Lord, but I think it gives them uh, something more like a foundation to to build their life on and something that's much um, much stronger, much more sturdy than what your what your family's customs were, what your church's practices were. But when they know what God says, that's that's the difference. So, so good. Emma, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say I agree um, wholeheartedly with that. And that's why I think it's important to um, to just continue to read the Bible with your children and and then um, do it in adulthood. And that can look different yeah. um, depending on your circumstances. Like, I think that the pressure sometimes and if you don't, you know, if you don't go back to the why is it important to memorize scripture, then those habits will quickly fall to the wayside. So um, the importance thing is a factor, but I think also alleviating the pressure of um, of having to, you know, and, and this is a practice that, you know, we should continue to do is sitting there with your with your Bible and, and reading and meditating on that word and, um, and having that private reading practice. But I also think that, you know, having other options to being a part of a, um, a Bible reading community is important for people to know is, is out there, you know, listening to dramatized scripture, um, is, is a good practice to do. And it's something that is a lot easier for other people if they're, um, you know, if they're on the go or they're auditory learners or, um, something that's a practical thing that people can do on the go. And so, um, yeah, so I just think that, um, you know, as we mature and get older, that maybe the habits that were formed in, in childhood, although good and laying the foundation, it's, it's nice to know that in adulthood, um, you don't have to have your habits look exactly the same as they did in your childhood, but you need to, you need to know the why and what's helpful with the why and importance is having a solid community. Um, and so I feel really passionate about, you know, surrounding yourself with, with people who can help, um, spur you to do that. And so, yeah. This has illuminated so much for me. Like Emma, when we were talking about the stages of the trip, I mean, we talked about the grammar stage and the dialectic and the rhetoric. I think sometimes we leave the kids in the grammar stage of scripture or, or Bible memorization, right? So it's like, sure. we, we teach them a scripture, but we don't allow them to the time and the space to develop and to understand what that means so that they can actually defend their faith. And the reason I thought of that is when Dakota was talking about having your, your biblical worldview, when someone challenges that you can't defend it because it was never personalized. You never had the opportunity to really hone in on it and own it for yourself. It was just like, well, mommy said that, or daddy says, this is what we believe. Right? So I think outside of just like having this anchor in tough times where we can say, well, the Bible does say that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or the Bible did say this, or the Bible said, said that. I think outside of that practical application, it's really about having your personal testimony and studying to show yourself approved and really being able to defend what you're believing because you actually understand it. We've passed the stage of just memorizing something, but also understanding why we believe it and why it's important to us. And if we don't do it, I think it's a disservice to, um, or children and or generation and really a missed opportunity. So I wanted to ask you to, because I, I believe in practical application, you have done such a great job at weaving in examples of how to do this and, and resources, but if you'd like to reiterate any resources or practical application of memorizing scripture and making this personal, please share and please share, you know, resources for the company, shameless plug, go for it. <laughs> So one of the tools that Scripture Memory Fellowship offers is uh, an app called Verse Locker, and it's a, a free app. And I know sometimes we're skeptical of that word free. We think, yeah, free for a week or whatever. Can't be that good. Completely free. 
hundred uh, percent. But it it'll help you memorize any verse, and so you could say, "I want to memorize Psalm twenty three, and it'll actually begin to quiz you on the verse, and it'll show you the whole verse. But then it starts to hide words, and so your job as the memorizer is to start filling in those words. Uh, it'll also do this thing where it shows you the first letter of each word in the verse, which sounds weird, but it is so helpful because you can just look at those initials and try to recite the verse based on those. And that gets your memory involved at a pretty early stage. It'll play your verses on a loop if you want to listen to them while you're driving or while you're doing things around the house. Um, so you can add any verse you want to memorize. It also has a, a large library of memory courses that we have put together at SMF. And so you can download those for free and, and memorize those as well. So yeah, check that out. It's Verse Locker. Uh, you can just look for it in your app store. And then uh, another resource I would mention is a book that we just released called Remember the Words, Why mm. and How to Make Scripture Memory a Way of Life. Um, and that's at scripturememory.com slash remember. And it it's like an hour long to read. It's, it's not a big doorstop of a book, but it just explores, first of all, why should we as believers take this seriously? Is scripture memory really that important? Hey, we live in the 21st century. We have smartphones with the Bible on it. How does that impact the equation, right? So it explores some of that, and then it gets into the very practical. You know, if you're an auditory memorizer, here are some mm -hmm. things that you can try. If you're a visual memorizer, here are some things you can try. If your kids really don't like memorizing scripture, here are some things that you can do to make that more engaging for the whole family. And so, yeah, it's a, a great book that just kind of unpacks some of the why, but then for those who believe that it's worth doing, it'll also uh, just take you through some very practical ways that you can get started. I love that. Um, I Something that we do at the Grace and Mercy Foundation and that we emphasize is it's training, not trying. Mm -hmm. And so what I like um, about Verse Locker is it is that that training is you know, how do we, um, how do we get to the memorization? And it's not just, you know, trying to memorize, it's actually like a practical training, um, that you can do. And so that's what we emphasize at, at the foundation. Um, just, we're supposed to train, um, reading God's word, like soldiers, athletes and hardworking farmers. And so, um, we also have an app. <laughs> we also have a free app, um, it's, uh, the PRS app and you can search it in the app store, um, just under the public reading of scripture. And, um, it is a collection of audio drama Bibles in various different languages. We have, um, of course, English, Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, um, Japanese and Korean. And, um, we're currently working on some other audio drama Bibles that will be released soon. Um, and so you can listen to those all for free. And there's also a tracker, um, in the app, which is a part of that, that training, um, so that you can track how much of the Bible you've listened to. And, um, at the foundation, we of course encourage to read the whole Bible and give some, some plans and some guides as to how you can achieve that in a year. It's only 98 hours to listen to the entire Bible in one year. And there's some practical ways to kind of break that down. Um, if, if that was your goal for the year. And so, um, that's really neat. And then that other, that other um, component of um, what we do at the foundation being in community. We have public reading of scripture sessions um, at the Grace and Mercy Foundation three times a week where we listen to extended passages of the Bible for an hour. Um, you can join those. It's open to anyone. Um, you can go to the website prsi.org and um, fill in your information um, with your email and you'll get sent the Zoom link um, where you can join a live public reading of scripture session. And so we just encourage organizations to implement this, um, you know, into their practice, whether that be on a staff level or um, through their clients or just in their personal family life um, is to um, continue to practice reading the scripture out loud, listening to it regularly um in community and the entire bible and so um yeah and so that's what i help to uh do at the foundation and so it's just a wonderful time to be amongst christians um listening to the bible 
Love it. I love how practical these resources are. My boys actually have content from Scripture Memory Foundation, and we started off with Psalm 1, and we were like acting it out, and they were writing on their boards and memorizing, and I was so amazed at how quickly they were able to, like you said, they're sponges. I was so amazed at how quickly they were able to memorize it, and my oldest son just asked me recently, like, why don't we go back to the Grace and Mercy Foundation? I want to go back to the public reading of Scripture, and I was like, okay, that's amazing. Time. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's such, it's so beautiful to hear that they want to do it. And Dakota, thank you for sharing that. The app Verse Locker actually gives these tools and suggestions that it actually mirror the person's learning styles. Because, you know, if someone is like, well, I'm an auditor uh, learner, or I'm a visual learner, or I'm kinesthetic, like you really want to be able to lean into that. So thank you for sharing that for anyone who's listening and already has 10 excuses for why they can't do it. We've got them covered. Yeah. And also just to touch on what you just said, I I forgot to say that if either of you are in the tri-state area near New York City, you're welcome to come to the Grace and Mercy Foundation's office and be a part of those public reading of scripture sessions in person. You'll be fed a free meal. Um, <laughs> we believe strongly that, you know, God's word is like, you know, food for our souls. And so what better way to model that than to actually have food that you eat with other people um and share that that communion with it essentially so um yeah if dakota you're ever in new york let me know and i would love to love to see you at the office <laughs> yes thank you so much you said uh there's food so i'm on my way <laughs> yes there is food i can guarantee that it's always very very yummy food they are very serious about that in new york Monday, City, wednesday so. friday right Yes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, three different times. So Monday in the evening, Wednesday afternoon, and then Friday there's breakfast. So um, depending on your work schedule, um, we offer those three times. Can I say one final thing? And that Please is, do. I think that for so many, I was in this group, we push back on the idea of memorizing scripture for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One is, boy, I just don't have time. Mm-hmm. And the other one is, I don't have a good memory. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about I don't have enough time to memorize scripture. I saw um, a survey recently that said the average person is spending something like two hours every single day on their smartphone. Mm -hmm. Guilty. I mean, most <laughs> I'm surprised it's not more. Yeah. And let's just think about that. Are we tithing our time to our smartphones? And then we're giving God the crumbs that fall from the table. I mm. think a lot of us are. And that's convicting to think about. Now, you might say, well, I'm not that person. I'm not on my phone two hours a day. There is nothing more important than memorizing scripture and getting God's word in your heart. There's a guy named Andrew Davis. He memorized like 40 books of the Bible. And he says, when judgment day comes, we will not regret a single moment that we spent memorizing scripture, but we'll wish that we had spent more time memorizing mm -hmm. the scripture. So I think we all have time. And if we don't, we should make time. Uh, and then if you think I have a bad memory, that was me. My mom would tell me as a young man, she'd say, Dakota, you could get lost in Winnie the Pooh's one acre wood because I just, I didn't have a good memory. I couldn't remember, you know, what, what I had for breakfast, let alone a chapter of scripture. Uh, but what I realized is I thought I had a bad memory, but really I had just never applied myself to memorize scripture. I have a friend who has memorized the entire New Testament, wow. the entire New Testament. And you know what? He has spent hundreds and hundreds of hours working on that. Mm -hmm. And imagine if someone comes up and they say, Aaron, I, I, could, I couldn't do that. I have a bad memory. He might say, well, how about you spend 400 hours working on the gospel of Matthew and then tell me how much progress you made. You know, for most people, it's not really a matter of gifting. Yeah. It's not a matter of, you know, how naturally you can memorize scripture. It's just a matter of carving out the time. And so that was a helpful thing when I was 14, getting started with this to realize, you know what? It's not that I had a bad memory. It's just that I had never really intentionally sought to mm. fill my memory with God's word. And once I started setting aside consistent time every day, suddenly things clicked and, and I was able to, to recall and by the way, it gets easier with practice. It's like going to the gym. It gets easier the more you go. Your memory is really like a muscle. And so if it yeah. really is painful for the first few weeks, take heart. 
you'll find a rhythm and your memory will will start latching onto those verses more easily with each passing week. Yeah. And it's only like two and a half to four hours of listening to the Bible a week to finish the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So if you devote yourself to memorizing, say, just, you know, the New Testament, I mean, you know, that's like two lunch breaks or (laughs) a week. Like it's not even... So the time thing is is a very interesting argument. I think it's just hard for people when there's not a structure or an actual mm-hmm. time set aside for them to join, um, where it's like, oh, I actually have to do this myself, um, which, yeah, makes things a little bit more difficult. But yeah, the, the time thing is, um, it's really practical if you break it down in, in that way. And um, yeah, and the more you listen, the easier it is to memorize. So so yeah, it's a very good so point. They, yeah. So there you have it. The transparency of we get it. It's hard. There are a lot of things happening or minds are being, you know, pulled in so many different directions. We get it. The introspection and the challenging question of are you tithing your time to your smartphone? Thank you for that, Dakota. And, you know, the perspective of we can do something if we want to. It's just about being intentional and prioritizing, making first things first. And the strategy, you have resources beyond resources beyond resources. So all your excuses are snatched. I would love to hear your comments, feedback, thoughts, and how you've implemented this, not just with your children, but for you personally too, because it's important for us all to memorize scripture and prioritize God's word so that we can hide it in our heart and have our own testimony and personal story of God's handprint in our lives. So Dakota, Emma, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your practical tips and for sharing your story with us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, this was uh, wonderful. And it was so great to meet you, Dakota, and have this conversation.